Uh, my name is Andy Woods. I'm an, a professor of Bible and theology with the College of Biblical Studies in Houston, Texas, and I'm so happy to be spending a little time with you this morning. What we started last time was basically a five-part series on the doctrine of the rapture. And for the first half of this series, we're basically answering the what question. What uh, exactly is the rapture? And then in subsequent sessions, we're going to be talking about when is the rapture, not giving you a date for the rapture, but rather sort of getting into the whole discussion of when does the rapture take place relative to the coming tribulation period. But for, for now, we're answering the what question. What is the rapture? And basically what we're doing is we're using two sections of the Bible to help us with that. We last time used 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 17, and we saw several uh, important things about the rapture. We saw that the rapture is an important event. We saw that it is a, an event distinct from the second advent of Jesus at the end of the seven-year tribulation period. We saw it will involve the catching away of all living Christians who are on the earth at the time. And we also saw that it will be a reunion. Uh, of the deceased in Christ and alive Christians. And now what we're doing is we're turning to another section of Scripture, and we're going to develop some more characteristics of the rapture if we could. So if I could invite your attention to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 50 through 57, I'm going to go ahead and read these verses to you. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an, of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this imperish, excuse me, when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks uh, be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and immo immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain." Some more characteristics to develop, if we can, about the rapture. I think we see six more truths about the rapture from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 50 through 57. Uh, the next truth about the rapture, this would be number five, if you're a note taker. The next truth about the rapture is the rapture, in essence, will be a resurrection. And 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is a chapter that deals all about the resurrection and its various implications. And it seems that those in Corinth were questioning the reality of resurrection. You see that back in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 12. And Paul says, no, 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 don't question the reality of resurrection. Resurrection is real. Resurrection is part of God's program. In fact, the resurrection program began with Christ and the resurrection program will continue. And part of that resurrection program is the resurrection program that God has in store for the church. And so let's define just for a moment what we mean by resurrection. When we say somebody is going to be resurrected or somebody has been resurrected, what basically are we talking about? Well, resurrection is really the opposite of death. When a person dies, basically what happens is the part of them which is designed to live forever, we would call that the soul, uh, the Greek uses the word suke. There's a part of us that's designed to live forever. That part of us 
separates from the physical body. Uh, when that happens, that is the reality of death. The body and the soul separate. Uh, this is what happened to Stephen at the end of Acts chapter 7. You'll see a reference to it. It's even what happened to our Lord in Matthew chapter 27, about verse 50, 51, right in there, you'll see a reference to it. So when a person dies, the part of them that's designed to live forever separates from the body. So if we can understand death, all then we have to understand is resurrection. Resurrection is the opposite of death. When a resurrection happens, the part of us that is designed to live forever, the soul, is placed into a glorified body. It is placed into a body that is not corrupted, a body that is not contaminated, a body that is not aging, a body that never gets sick, an uncursed body, because we all, no matter how much we try to beautify ourselves, uh, we are all living in corrupted bodies that are deteriorating because of sin. You remember God told Adam and Eve, from dust you are, to dust you shall return. And so the body is deteriorating, the body is aging. But at the point of resurrection, the part of us that's designed to live forever is placed into a new body. So the question then becomes, when do we as members of Christ's church, that would be everyone who has lived and died between the day of Pentecost and the rapture, when are we as members of Christ's church going to be resurrected? And the fact of the matter is we are all going to be resurrected at the point of the rapture. The rapture is that point in time in which all church-aged belie church believers are going to be placed in new bodies. Now, question, why do we have to be placed in a new body? The answer is this current body that we're in, you see this in verse 50, you see it in verses 53 through 54 where it talks about flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. We must be changed. We must be transformed. The fact of the matter is this present body that I am in is not fit for heaven. You say, why not? Well, because in this body, I still have the potential to sin. This body is sinful, but heaven is a place of holiness. And also in this particular body, it's temporary. It's aging. It's wearing out. It can get sick. It's, it's a lot like a used car in a certain sense where, you know, you put a certain number of miles on your car and then after it reaches a certain number of miles, you've got to bring that car in for more tune-ups because the car is wearing out. That's a pretty good analogy to the body that I'm in. It can take a certain number of miles, but as I get older, the body has problems, the body has difficulties, and suddenly the trips to the doctor become more frequent. So this body is temporary, this body is wearing out, and yet heaven is eternal. So to be in heaven, I'm not properly equipped for it at the present time. In fact, if you do any deep sea uh, diving, uh, in essence, what you will see is that your present physical body is not equipped for deep sea diving. First of all, it's very cold under the water, deep down in the ocean, your body can't handle it. Secondly, you can't breathe the water, so your lungs are not equipped to handle deep sea diving at that level. Uh, you can't propel yourself, so you need fins. So your body has to be equipped the right way for deep sea diving with the proper scuba diving equipment. Well, it's very much the same with eternity. God, to prepare us for eternity, has to, in essence, have us in the right equipment. And so that's why we all desperately need a new resurrected body. And what Paul is revealing here is that we as members of Christ's church will receive our resurrected bodies at the point of the rapture. Living believers will receive their new resurrected bodies at the point of the rapture. Verse 51, those that are deceased in Christ, dead in Christ over the last 2,000 years of church history will receive their resurrected bodies at the point of the rapture as well. Verse 52, 
So this next point that we're making here is the rapture is a very significant doctrine because in essence what it is is it's the resurrection program of God. Jesus rose from the dead and so will we. Jesus was resurrected and so will we. We will be placed in this glorified body at the point of the rapture. Let me take you, if I could, to a yet another point. This would be number six in the total list of points we're making about the rapture in our series. Number six, the rapture will exempt an entire generation of Christians from death. And we see that in verse uh, 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. Now, when he says sleep there, it's a polite way of saying death. It's what we call a euphemism. It's a polite way of saying someone has died. So when he says asleep, that's in essence what he is talking about. He says specifically here, we will not all sleep. And then down in verses uh, 50. Four through 56, you see the repetition of that phrase, oh, death, where is your sting? Death has been swallowed up in victory. And so in essence, what Paul is talking about here is there's coming a point in time in which there will be a removal of an entire generation of believers from planet Earth before they experience death of natural causes. So when the rapture happens, we will not all sleep. In fact, there will be a removal of an entire generation of believers before the expiration of their natural lifespans. And is that not heartening? Uh, if, if you've ever seen somebody die, you know that it's a painful process. Death is not easy. Anybody that says death is easy has never witnessed somebody physically dying. Death is a terrible thing. And in fact, man's greatest fear is the fear of death. And yet what we're learning here is as the body wears out, there's the prospect or there's the possibility that maybe we, I don't know if it's us, I hope it's us, but maybe we will be that generation that the Apostle Paul is speaking of. There is coming a generation of believers on planet Earth that will not die because they will participate in the rapture. They will not have to go through the horrors and the difficulty and the pain of the normal death process. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. You're saying this sounds like science fiction more than it sounds like theology. But let me uh, assure you of something. This notion or this idea of people being caught up to the Lord before the expiration of their normal lifespans is a concept that is taught very clearly in the Bible from cover to cover. In fact, all you have to do is read through the Bible and you'll see several people that have already been raptured, uh, taken out before they experience their natural life, uh, the end of their natural lifespan. Enoch in Genesis chapter 5 was taken to be with the Lord. He was raptured. Elijah in 2 Kings chapter 2, was similarly raptured. Um, Christ, now Christ was a little bit different because he was already in his glorified body, but Christ in Acts chapter 1, and it's also narrated for us in Revelation 12 and verse 5, was snatched up. He was a harpazo, caught up to be with the Father. Philip, uh, the evangelist there in Samaria in Acts chapter 8 was similarly uh, raptured. He was caught up. And then, unfortunately, in his case, he was brought back down. Uh, I would just assume stay up there with the Lord. Uh, but Philip was actually brought back down to continue his ministry, as was the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, verses 7 through 10. He was caught up to the third heaven. And he saw things indescribable. Now, Paul also, like Philip, came back down. John in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1 is caught up to see the apocalypse. John also came back down. In Revelation chapter 11, there are two witnesses. These two witnesses are killed. They seem to be uh, resuscitated or revived or they are brought back to life. This is all described in Revelation chapter 11. And then they are snatched or they are caught up as onlookers 
look on. And so consequently, this idea of people being taken out, people being snatched, people being caught up to be with the Lord before their lifespans naturally end is a concept that has already occurred many times in the Bible. So Paul, really, when he talks about this future rapture of the church, is not talking about something completely new. The only difference here is that when the rapture takes place or when the rapture transpires, God is going to take a whole busload of people. He's going to take not just one person here or there or two people here or there. There's an entire generation that will be exempted from death and taken to be uh, with the Lord. And so this is what Paul is talking about. The rapture will exempt an entire generation of Christians from death. I pray that we would be that generation. Perhaps we will be in God's timing, but I can't necessarily guarantee you that. Let me take you to another characteristic of the rapture. We are still in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And this is number seven, if you're a note taker. Number seven, the rapture will take place instantaneously. Uh, Notice, if you will, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 52. It says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last, uh, the last trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. Now, he analogizes, Paul does, the, the speed at which the rapture will occur to the twinkling of an eye. Now, think about this just for a second. How long does it really take you to twinkle your eye? How long does it really take you to blink? Uh, it, it takes place within a split second. And in essence, the rapture is going to occur just that fast. You see, sometimes God, when he does a work, takes a long period of time to do it. Other times when God does a work, he doesn't necessarily have to take a long time to do it, but he can do it in an instant. You know, sometimes God takes a very long time to do something. For example, Israel was in Babylonian captivity for 70 years. That's a 70-year cycle that God was working with. But other times when God does a work, he can do it in an instant, in the twinkling of an eye. And that is what Paul is revealing concerning the rapture. In fact, what's interesting, if you look back here at verse 52, Paul uses the word uh, in a moment, in a moment. Now, the Greek word for moment is atomo. And what English word comes from the word atomo? Well, we get the word atom. And so it's very interesting that uh, Paul placed a special emphasis on the speed at which the rapture will occur. In fact, he analogized it, it would seem, to one of the smallest particles known uh, to man. Now, did Paul understand all of that when he was writing? I'm not, I'm not sure he did. But that's what the Holy Spirit superintended. And so the rapture of the church is analogized to one of the smallest, slightest particles known to man. In other words, when the rapture will occur, it will, it will take place in a, in a very similar fash, fashion. The speed at which the rapture will occur is analogized to one of the smallest particles known to man. In fact, the rapture will take place in the twinkling of an eye, just that fast. And let's turn, if we could, to yet another characteristic of the rapture. We are now on number eight, and we are developing a list of characteristics of the rapture from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And the next concept is this. The rapture is a mystery. The rapture is a mystery. And uh, notice, if you will, verse 51. Paul says, behold, I tell you a mystery. Now, what uh, do we mean by the word mystery? Uh, I think mystery is a very uh, unfortunate translation because when we think of the word mystery, we substitute our English word for mystery, and we think of something that has to be searched out to find its meaning. You know, you have to be careful, you have to search out the truth, and finally, if you're diligent enough, you could solve the mystery. It's it's that way when we read a mystery novel. When you read a mystery novel, the the truth of whodunit, so to speak, is not disclosed right at the beginning. You have to be diligent and careful, and finally, it's not until the last chapter of the book that you discover who uh, committed the murder. 
that's when you discover perhaps that the butler did it. But that's not how Greek uses the word mystery. When the Greek language uses the word mystery, a mystery in essence is a revelation of a truth. It is a truth that has never been disclosed before, but now it is disclosed. It is something hidden, something that you can't discover in another part of the Bible, but now Paul, in essence, is divulging it. Uh, Paul, in essence, is revealing it. And so that, in essence, is what the mystery is. The mystery of the rapture is something that is unknown in the pages of the Old Testament, but now Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is, is disclosing it, he is revealing it, he is bringing it to our attention. So this is something very important to understand. The rapture is not found in the pages of the Old Testament. The second advent of Christ at the end of the tribulation, by contrast, is taught in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. In fact, the oldest book of the Bible Job makes a reference to the second advent of Christ in Job 19, where he says, I know that my Redeemer lives, and in the end he will stand upon the earth. So the second advent is clearly taught all the way through the Old Testament, but not the rapture. To discover the truth of the rapture, in essence, what you need to do is you need to study the Apostle Paul. Paul is, for the first time, revealing the truth or revealing the concept of the rapture. And in fact, it's not just the rapture that Paul is revealing. He is revealing the whole mystery of the church. The church itself, the body of Christ, is not revealed in the Old Testament. You know, you can uh, read the Old Testament until your eyes bleed. And in essence, you'll never uh, discover a single reference to the church, You'll never discover a single reference to the rapture. These are all Pauline church age doctrines, which are now being disclosed by Paul. You know, Jesus said of the church in Matthew 16 and verse 18, he says, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. So the church is something new. The church is something brand new. It's a new work of God. And in fact, Paul had a special assignment from God. God took the Apostle Paul and gave him a special task. And Paul's task was to fill out or to reveal or to disclose the mystery of the church. This new work of God called the church, which began on the day of Pentecost and continues until the church is raptured out of the world. God's calling on Paul's life was to be used by the Holy Spirit to reveal these Truths. We can't discover what God's purpose is for the church by reading the Old Testament simply because the church is unrevealed there. But now the church is revealed. And so God set this man, the Apostle Paul, aside, and his task was to be used by the Spirit of God to articulate, to describe all of the theology related to the church. And so Paul talks about what is a church. How does the church function? He talks about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which you need in a worship service for the church to function properly. He talks about all the gifts of the Holy Spirit. He talks about how the church began. And as Paul continues to write, he also talks about how the church will end. That is part of this mystery doctrine or this mystery teaching. How the church began, it began with a miracle. Well, how will the church end? What Paul is saying is the church will also end with a miracle. It will end with the miraculous event called the rapture of the church. The church began with a miracle. And in essence, what happened in Acts chapter 2 is 3,000 people on the day of Pentecost were miraculously saved. And what Paul is saying here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is that the church will end with a similar miracle. You can't find this miracle in the Old Testament. You have to go to Paul to understand it and to study it. And so consequently, the church will end with a miracle, just like the church began with a miracle. And it was Paul's task and it was Paul's function as a servant of Christ to fill out or to describe in great detail all of this mystery age truth.
And so the Apostle Paul writes 13 letters. And in those 13 letters, he describes all of the aspects of a church, how a church functions, what is the church. And he also describes how the church will miraculously end because that's part of the teaching as well. And so therefore, the rapture of the church is a mystery. It's a new truth, never before unfolded, never before revealed, never before disclosed, but now it is being unfolded in all of its magnificence. Have you ever <clears throat> wondered why the Apostle Paul spent so much time in jail? You know, you read about Paul's life and he is in jail so frequently. He's in jail in Caesarea and then there are two uh, imprisonments of Paul where he is in prison in Rome. And why did God allow him to be in jail so frequently? And the answer is in a first century jail, which was basically a cave, um, in some cases a dungeon, in other cases, it's being in a house. Paul was in house arrest for his first imprisonment. But being in those circumstances, you don't have anything to do except write. And God, there's no color television. Uh, there's no uh, weight room. There's no activities to do. And so Paul had nothing to do but write. And so the Spirit of God used Paul in a significant way to pen the pages of God's Word during his stay in prison. And consequently, Paul fills out the mystery nature of the church, even describing how the church will end miraculously. So the, the, so the rapture of the church is a mystery. It is a new truth never before disclosed. So clearly we see more important truths about the rapture. It's a resurrection. It will exempt an entire generation of Christians from death. It will take place instantaneously, even taking place in the twinkling of an eye. And the rapture itself is also a mystery. You can't find it anywhere else in Scripture. But when we carefully study the Apostle Paul and the 13 letters we uh, referenced, we see clearly the rapture of the church.